The Thompson, before we start tonight, we're going to show a video. The Thompson school children organized and had their own town meeting. They came up with warrant articles. They appointed, I think they had selectmen and school committee people and a moderator, and they voted on actual articles. So we're going to, Bill Hainer, as the liaison, has asked that we play this. They videoed it, edited it, and so we've got about three or four minutes of video. Then we're going to bring the magical singers out. So, Dave, if you would. Oh. Got too bright. Town meeting. So, this is the third time that we've done this. Um, Bill and I planned this out a while ago, and um, Laura McKenney has been doing this with me for um, all three years. Siobhan had shared with me that it was part of their curriculum and in getting involved in uh, this aspect of it. And I like history. And uh, as the teacher, uh, it's very spontaneous. The more excitement the children present, the more excited that you get, and the easier it is to do all the work. So first, Mr. Hainer came in and explained the different elements of a warrant article and that we have to really think about different pieces. It kind of prepares them for what would a warrant article look like um, and what kinds of issues are brought up in warrant articles. I asked them, what types of things would you be think people should do in the towns. We put it up on the board, we brainstorm, and little by little I asked them, uh, do you think, how much money would this cost? Do we have enough money? What would you like not to have if we got rid of it? And little by little they understand, they learn and understand that although there are great ideas and things, it won't help everybody and it might cost too much money. They were extremely excited. When we walked in, we had parents set up at tables so the children all knew their precinct number and they had to go in and they had to register at their precinct table. And so they were checked off and then they came in, got settled, sat down. You know, they're all in the middle of town hall, so this is for some of them their first opportunity to see town hall and it's a beautiful building. And then um, Bill started the process off. I'm gonna ask you to raise your right hand and you're going to repeat after me. Then sat down and I invited uh, the first person to present their article and they did it. We declare that Arlington should have an animal shelter. We, the children of Arlington, have seen animals that are hurt, neglected, and hungry. We believe there should be a, a place in Arlington where these animals can be taken care of. We believe Arlington should provide money for staff and survive supplies and a building with several rooms and a yard for this animal shelter. Thank you. I asked them for the, to be seconded. They did. And we went back and forth, those for and those against. My name is Yvonne Novato. I'm from Precinct 2 and I think there shouldn't be an animal an animal shelter because my, my dad was once hurt by a, a wild wolf and I suddenly did not like that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Uslam Cleus, and I live on Precinct 1, and I think that we should have animal shelters because dogs need attention and they can need help crossing the streets because they will get run over. Thank you. When we finished, I asked if there were any new information, and when there wasn't any, we had a voice vote first, which wasn't clear, and we had tellers, just like we have a town meeting, and I explained that, and they counted the vote, and each article passed. Other years, I felt like we had sat on opposite sides, so it was kind of already decided what side you were on for each argument, but the children really mixed in together, which I thought was great, because you could be sitting next to somebody who had a completely different opinion than you, or was from a different class and came up with a different idea, and that was okay. The thing that I've noticed with my kids is they have a lot of confidence in themselves with raising different issues and debating points with each other, and that's grown, I think, through this process. In the beginning, they were a little more reticent to share their opinions, some of them, and now they're they're all doing it because they realize that they can disagree with somebody else in the class and they can do it in a respectful way. Except for their age, I think every one of them could have qualified as a town meeting member this year. <laughs> Great job, kids. And Bill Hainer almost did a good job as moderator. Uh, <laughs> No, not really. 
I'd like you all to just take a look. The, the teachers and the children from Thompson School that participated in this. Keep it up, kids. In a few years, you can be here. All right, thank you. Oh, light. Okay, this evening we have the magical sing Madrigal Singers. They're going to sing the Star Spangled Banner for us and one or two other selections, I believe. Please rise. Sorry, we just finished our Pops concert this past weekend and we thought we'd treat you to Magic Carpet Ride by the gentlemen, Shambhala by the ladies, and then we'll close with a medley. Enjoy.
two, three. Ow. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. Ow. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. Shambhala. Wash away ooh. my trouble, wash away my pain with the wind of Shambhala. Hey, wash away ooh. my sorrow, wash away my shame with the wind of Shambhala. Shambhala. medley will feature Michael Reynolds, Clara Havia, Nate Wright, and Shannon Hirsch as soloists.
wish that this all would end Cause I could use some friends for a change And some nights I'm scared you'll forget me again Some nights I always win, I always win But I still wake up, I still see your ghost Oh Lord, I'm still not sure what I stand for Oh, what do I stand for? Are there any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Looks like not. Everyone's in. Okay. Um, oh, there's someone back there. Where? New guy, stand up. You're a new town meeting member? Oh, raise your hand. Oh, repeat after me. Raise your right hand. Aye. Aye. Name. David White. Will participate fully and fairly evaluate. Fully evaluate all merits for town meeting. And vote in the best interest of the town. Vote in the best interest of the town. I support free speech. Will treat others with mutual respect. I support free speech. Treat others with mutual respect. And will conduct myself in a civil manner that is becoming of an elected town meeting member. 
I do solemnly swear that I will perform, that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon me. Of the town of Arlington. Thank you. You <laughs> talked that down. Good to hear. I was proud of it. Walked right up front. Good job, David. Um, I like to, you know, we had a fire down at um, Brookside Village yesterday, and there was one, one gentleman passed away. If we can have a moment of silence for that gentleman. Um, The name hasn't been released by his family yet, so we're not, we don't know who he is. Um, I recognize the chair of the board of selectmen, Mr. Greeley. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. As our, my town manager, our town manager, just pointed out how appropriate one of the lines we heard tonight from the Madrigal Singers, some nights I wish this all would end. Mr. Moderator. <laughs> It is moved that if all of the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 11th at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. Well, then let's finish. Any announcements or resolutions? Sir. Jason Donnelly, Precinct 5. I just want to draw your attention to a uh, fundraiser celebration happening next Saturday, uh, May 16th at Thompson School for Arlington Eats. Uh, in less than a year, Arlington Eats has fed, uh, has provided more than 7,500 meals to our children. These are our kids in our community. Uh, and so there are flyers in the back. And I also have bigger ones if you want. You can see me during the break. Um, you can hang them on telephone poles or signs. <laughs> That's up to you. At least for now. Mr. Kleinman. Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1. As the moderator mentioned, in our precinct we had a major fire yesterday. Um, there are many folks that are now are homeless. There is a fund that has been set up. But I especially want to thank the fire department and I want to thank the police. When I got up in the morning and I was able to walk over and see, the reaction was incredible. And the work that they did was incredible. It is unfortunate what has happened to the folks that live there. And so it's probably one of the worst that we've had in a while. But we need to always remember that our public safety and our public safety departments are amazing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Ma. Oh, you beat John up. Okay, go ahead. John, she beat you. Uh, Pam Hallett's Precinct 21. Uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington, in conjunction with the town, has set up a fundraiser for the Arizona terrorist Brookside condominium victims. Uh, many of them are very low income, having Section 8. They have lost their security deposits. They may not be able to get their rent back. They will need security deposits, moving expenses, furniture, Close. So we would prefer just money come in at this point so that we can at least get people housed with security deposits first month's and last month's rent. So um, it's on the Housing Corporation website. Just go to the Donate uh, button. Uh, when you go to that page, excuse me, uh, put down fire so that we know that you are specifically donating to help victims of this fire. Thank you. There are at least 15 families that desperately need money to move on with their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Marnow.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Mara, Precinct 14. The Sims nonprofit uh, committee uh, administers about a million dollars of funds left over from the dissolution of the uh, Sims Hospital. We make grants each year about this time. Uh, if uh, it is for uh, medical uses, and that term is uh, uh, very broadly applied uh, for me any kind of medical use in the greater Arlington community. Uh, as I said, we have about a million dollars. Uh, we usually uh, give around between thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. If anybody has any ideas with regard to that, I'm very glad to hear from you. Uh, it's administered by a three-member committee: myself, Charles Lyons, a former town uh, uh, board of selectmen, and Jackie Keshin, a, a former uh, council on aging uh, nurse. So uh, glad to talk to anybody about that during the break. Thank you, sir. Any other announcements, Ms. Howard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jane Howard from Precinct 10, and also a member of uh, the Vision 2020 Standing Committee representing town meeting. Uh, I have three announcements tonight and then a fourth. Perhaps you've seen these on polls as well. The first announcement is that uh, these are all uh, Vision 2020 sponsored or co-sponsored events that happen in May. The first is Elements. Art Rock Spy Pond Park, and it opens on Saturday with a reception from 3 to 5, and all the artists for the installations, and there are 12 of them, will explain their works. It's, it's an absolutely amazing exhibit. Perhaps you've, some of you have seen it going up. It's taken quite a bit of work. The second uh, announcement is that the following Saturday, uh, May 16th, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. will be the annual Spy Pond Trails Day. And we're looking for people to come and help finish the last path down to the pond that will be made out of stone to um, tick, pick up trash. There's an awful lot left over from the winter, especially along Route 2, and to prune and take out invasives. So that's the second one. Then on the 30th, there is a collaboration with several other organizations in town called Spy Pond Fun Day. And it will be from 1 to 4 on that Saturday afternoon, unless it rains heavily, and then it will be on Sunday at the same time, the 31st. And there will be music, arts and crafts, kayaks for you to use, canoes, the Belmont and Arlington crew will put on a demonstration and then people can learn, uh, at least several people. Uh, I don't know how many we can accommodate in those hours for uh, learning how to row with them in their eights. There will also be rides to Elizabeth Island. Uh, the last announcement is uh, I'm doing for David Ardito, who is Director of Visual Arts for the Arlington Public Schools. And he called me to tell me that there is a wonderful exhibit that has been put up this afternoon on the second floor of the artwork of all the public schools in Arlington, all nine of them, grades K through 12. No, no school is left out. And it will be there for a while. So he hopes that you will take advantage of that and, and uh, go see it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Mr. Tosti? Tosti? Bob Tozy, Precinct 20. This Saturday, May 9th, is the U.S. Postal Service Food Drive, otherwise known as the Stamp Out Hunger. Um, Non-perishable food donations are asked to be left at your door. Um, we ask that you check the dates. Don't leave any expired food because that just takes away from our time and, and adds more to our waste. Um, examples could be peanut butter, jelly, canned fruits and vegetables, and even toiletries. Anything to save the money in the food items can be used towards other costs. Um, and if you miss this Saturday, or the time slips by and it's Monday morning, you remember, you donate year-long at the food boxes around town or directly at the, sh the uh, food pantries. On Fridays from 1 to 3 at the Church of Our Savior on Marathon Street, 
or at the new satellite location on 117 Broadway on the first and third Thursdays from 9.30 to 11.30. Thank you all. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Our precinct will attempt to organize at the break over by the back table. Thank you. Um, any other announcements or resolutions? Okay, we're going to do our test vote every night. We have to do one to make sure the system's functioning. Tonight's test question is, do you think we're going to finish town meeting Monday? One is yes, two is no. Do you think we're going to finish town meeting on Monday? Five nights. Ready? All right, go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. That's an affirmative vote. Just uh, we're, we're, yes, sir. Yeah, the, um, something's what's wrong with the projector. Uh, a little more higher, Dave. Higher, up, up, up. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have any reports of committees? Any committee reports? Ms. Stamps? Ed Trembley and I are, uh, I'm Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. Ed Trembley, Precinct 19. And we're going to give a bipartisan tree committee report, trying to set a good example for town meeting. The Arlington Tree Committee, committee met once a month throughout the year. Tasks performed were working with towns uh, to. The Arlington Tree Committee met once a month throughout the year. Tasks performed were working with the town to help identify new tree locations, improving the tree stock submitting recommendations to the town's master plan, writing up a job description for the tree warden position, maintaining a booth at Town Day, Echo Fest, and the Monotomy Rocks Park's Earth Day celebration. Members have worked hard on community outreach, including updating the website, submitting a monthly Tree Matters article to the advocate, and efforts have also uh, been made to ensure that newly planted trees are watered and cared for. I'm gonna take a break from the report just for a second. Um, I'm hoping that all of you town meeting members and anybody watching at home will help the town, help all of us preserve our investment in trees by giving any new tree that's less than two or three years old uh, a good long drink of water, enough to make the roots try to, try to get enough water to go down deep so the roots will go deep uh, once a week. I'll put my committee here. So uh, while some members have retired from the tree committee, new members have joined bringing new energy and ideas. So in addition to the things that we've been doing uh, this year, some of our goals for the next year are to con continue to work with the DPW to, for more planting of trees. And uh, we've started exploring grant opportunities for even more trees than town meeting funds. Um, and possibly with targeted projects throughout the town that are really incredibly tree deficient. If anybody here wants to contact the tree committee and make a pitch for your neighborhood or a place you know of in Arlington that badly needs um, more tree canopy, just feel free to contact the tree committee through town hall. And um, <clears throat> also we, there's a new, um, we help the DPW fashion a new setback tree planting program this year which will continue to work with them and that's in places where the tree strip really isn't big enough or is non-existent so you really can't plant a tree in front of a house under state law we uh, fashion this program where within I think it's 20 feet um, back into the property uh, the town can plant a tree and we've done it in a few places and I think 
Mike Rademacher would say it's, it's a good addition to their toolkit. And finally, um, the issue has come up a lot in the last year. People throughout the town are concerned about removal of trees on private property during development, and the tree committee is going to start looking into um, what the town might be able to do about that. And we wanted to thank Mike Rademacher um, for the great job that he's done without the help or much help from a tree warden, which we are trying to, to fill a, a tree warden job. Um, he's done a great job with trees, and he reports, he comes to every tree committee meeting once a month and gives us a report on what he's been doing, and we brainstorm different ideas. It's been really great. And finally, people may not know that there's actually a fund that people can um, write checks to. It's called the Trees Please Fund. It is located at the DPW. I, I don't think the contributions are tax deductible, but we can always use more money for trees. So if you've got some extra cash laying around, please write a check to the Trees Please Fund and send it to uh, the DPW. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports or committees? Yep, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Ann Lee Royer. Uh, right into the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> Ann Lee Royer, Precinct 17, and I'm chair of the Open Space Committee. Um, our short report is in the town's printed um, town annual report, so I didn't make copies or anything. But I did want to let you all know that the committee uh, this past year has completed a draft new open space and recreation plan um, covering the years 2015 to 2022, seven years. Uh, this is the fourth plan that our committee has prepared since 1996 when this committee was formed by town meeting. Per the state statute, we've submitted the plan to the Division of Conservation Services and the Executive Office of Environmental Energy and Environmental Affairs, and that's the agency statewide that approves um, open space plans. And so we're waiting for their final approval. But um, in the meantime, we've received um, nice letters of support from various groups, the Board of Selectmen, the Conservation Commission, Park and Recreation Commission, the Redevelopment Board, as well as the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. And we really want to thank them all for their support and their participation in this process. And we look forward to um, seven, at least seven more years of collaborating with all these groups and many of the friends groups and others that are really concerned about protecting and enhancing and maintaining our um, valuable open spaces and natural resources and recreational facilities. Um, this draft plan is posted on the town website under the Open Space Committee page under Boards and Committees. Um, once we get our final approval from the state, we will um, make a few changes, last minute changes, and then the final report will be posted there. But you can still look at it now. And we encourage you to look at it online. Um, it's a big report, so we're not going to be printing a lot of copies, but there will be some copies available. Um, and so we'll be working with the ARB and the master plan, which um, corresponds a lot with a lot of the goals and objectives that are in this open space plan. And so look forward to your continuing support in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brazil. Julie Brazil, Precinct 12, and Chair of the Vision 2020 Standing Committee. I'd like to move receipt of the report of Vision 2020. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? It is so received. Thank you. Um, I just want to highlight a couple things from the report, which is on the back table tonight. Um, the annual survey is always a big project for Vision 2020. This year we had 6,058 households respond which is a 32% response rate. Um, the report contains the preliminary data. Uh, the complete analysis will be completed sometime, we hope, in June and posted to the Vision 2020 page on the town website. Um, but there are still some interesting tidbits just looking at the raw numbers uh, in the report this evening. Um, the slide behind me shows the nine town goals, which are the task groups for Vision 2020. Um, 
the uh, five underlined goals indicate the active task groups. And um, obviously, after the vote uh, for Article 12, we'll be reorganizing and uh, recruiting for the standing committee to create that new structure. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of outreach. Um, but there's a lot going on with Vision 2020 in general. And so I would like to um, uh, raise awareness about all of the goals and the potential for volunteers who are interested in some of the work we're doing. Uh, the diversity task group held a, a community discussion on unequal justice and organized a vigil to draw attention and support to the devastation in Nepal. The governance task group co-sponsored candidate night assisted with precinct meetings around town and organized the orientation for two new town meeting members. The environment task group consists of three committees. The spy pond committee delivered flyers to 3000 households in the spy pond watershed to educate residents about the impact of fertilizers on the pond's water quality. And uh, Jane Howard already mentioned the spy pond work days and events. The uh, wildlife habitat garden at the reservoir is pretty well established now, so the committee is expanding its work to include planting in the um, island in the parking lot and along the path to herd field, and they are coordinating with DPW to hand harvest water chestnuts from the reservoir again this summer. So if you have a canoe, keep an eye out for that announcement. Sustainable Arlington participated in EcoFest in March and has started discussions with town leaders about what it takes to be adaptable in the face of climate change. It is difficult to plan for unpredictable events, so climate resiliency will be a big theme uh, for their research in the next few months and will be the theme for next year's EcoFest. The Fiscal Resources Task Group is meeting later this month with Assessor Tierney to discuss the intricacies of commercial property assessments and they'll be meeting next month with Deputy Town Manager Flanagan to review the entire financial plan and all related financial communication tools and processes. And Arlington Public Art, which is a committee of the Culture and Recreation Task Group, will begin painting more transformer boxes uh, very shortly, which according to all of the exclamation marks in this year's survey is a very popular project. So if you know anyone who has ideas for other projects or would like to jump in on any of these, we're always happy to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other reports to committees? Seeing none, Mr. Tosti. I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Oh, all in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Article 3 is upon the table. That brings us to Article 17. Mr. Moderator? Sir. Uh, the Finance Committee uh, had a no report at this time on this issue. We were waiting to see if anything would happen that we could possibly accept. There's nothing that's happened. There's nothing on the horizon. Uh, and therefore, the Finance Committee moves no action on this article. I recommend voting no action by the Finance Committee. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 18, endorsement of CBGB applications. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Kevin Greeley, Selectman. Uh, this was put on the chairs, I believe, on the first night, and um, I asked town meeting to endorse the CDBG uh, recommended funding as voted by the Board of Selectmen and the Town Manager. Uh, CDBG funds are, come to us through uh, housing and urban development, and the funds need to be used for low and moderate income areas, low and moderate clientele, uh, low and moderate housing, slums or blighted areas, or what's called spot blight. Uh, outside of blighted areas like historic preservation or rehabilitation. Uh, this year we received requests for $1.8 million and we had $1.04 million to hand out. So unfortunately we couldn't uh, fund all of the requests. Uh, for those of you that may not be aware, more than 25, these funds are made available to cities and towns across the United States with populations of at least 50,000. Uh, we dropped below that at least 25 years ago, and because of the efforts of individuals like Charlie Lyons, Don Marquis at the time, 
Uh, they went into Tip O'Neill, and we were grandfathered in. And can you imagine since then, more than $25 million worth of funds have been made available to us. And uh, this year, we had a committee put together, which were two selectmen, Mr. Dan Dunn and Mr. Stephen Byrne, along with Carol Kowalski, our Director of Planning and Development, and working with the town manager's office. They went through all the requests. We had two, uh, two public hearings. Carol, two public hearings? Uh, two meetings. So a public hearing and then a meeting in terms of the approval uh, uh, of these. And so this report indicates to you uh, what was asked for under all of those categories I read to you and what has been voted by the town, man town manager and the Board of Selectmen. We seek your endorsement. Thank you. Any questions on CDBG money? Ah, Mr. Oster. Adam Oster, Precinct 3. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just have two questions that I hope will be quick. Um, uh, I notice in the description for the first item, uh, it mentions uh, developing brownfields, and I'm wondering if there are specific sites that are being eyed and where they are. Ms. Qual? Oh. Adam's going to answer it. Adam Chapman Lane, Town Manager. Can you, can you just point to me, Mr. Oster, where you're referencing? I'm sorry. On, on, uh, uh, on the enumeration of the uh, different things, it's on page three, the affordable housing program. It says for possible brownfield site cleanup for redevelopment for affordable housing. Oh, so, it, so that, is that, that just theoretical, or are there actual? Uh, places? I think t today it's theoretical, but it does stem from uh, a project uh, being considered by the Housing Corporation of Arlington, which would in, uh, involve them purchasing a piece of land that would require some brownfield cleanup. Uh, and, and my second question is: uh, the next item describes a loan program. To me, that implies there'll be repayment of loan. And how does that work? Uh, will we have that money to use again, or? Do I completely misunderstand what's happening here? Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Your understanding is correct. Uh, it is a, a loan program that in includes repayment. Uh, those monies come back into the CDBG program, and a certain percentage of prior year's program income can be used to then fund uh, the forward year's actual funding. And there is a piece of program income included in this year's funding schedule. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Any other questions? on? Mr. Warden. Yeah, I have a, uh, John Warden, Precinct 8. A question about that same <coughs> uh, first item under uh, rehabilitation housing. It doesn't say who's going to be uh, spending this $338,000 for, um, for um, developing more affordable housing. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. This particular request under affordable housing is uh, responding to a request for funding from the Housing Corporation of Arlington. I, I'm sorry, say again. It, this is responding to a request for funding from the uh, for, uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington. Housing Corporation of Correct. Arlington. But Correct. You, so you're going, so this, 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 uh, this appropriation is actually for the Housing Corporation of Arlington. That is accurate. Um, but I have a question in, in that respect. Um, the, the town meeting has twice gone on record as being opposed to uh, 40B, and, um, the, um, and the Mugar 40B proposal is, has attracted some little bit of attention in the past couple of weeks. Um, the Housing Corporation, according to rumor, uh, was proposing a 40B uh, a type project. And um, I don't know if you know anything about that, sir, but uh, it, it seems to me that in view of the town's general opinion on, on that subject, that we should not be, we should make any funds allocated to that uh, organization contingent on not going against town policy and do, trying to do a 40B in opposition to our zoning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Fuller. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Uh, just a comment on the rehabilitation housing funding. Uh, the two items together, although both worthy, seem to use up about 45% of all the CDBG money we can allot. And some other things are either underfunded or not funded. Uh, I know the demands are greater than the amount, but I'm hoping that as the Community Preservation Act comes online that some community preservation funds can take up some of the rehabilitation and housing needs and free up CDBG money for other things. And I thank the CDBG committee for their hard work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hainer? Oh, I don't think he had a question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. Uh, the money going towards the uh, for affordable housing, is, the, is there a particular piece of uh, property uh, being considered at this time? Mr. Chapterlane. Adam Chapterlane, Town Manager. Um, my understanding from the uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington is currently they are pursuing several projects, but the majority of these funds will go towards a proposal there or a project they're currently pursuing at 20 Westminster. Yeah, I, the reason I'm asking this question is it's my understanding, and I'll stand corrected, that we are so close to reaching the magic uh, number to uh, prevent any further 40B uh, housing and stuff. Can you speculate if this will reach it if, we, if it goes forward? Uh, I, I, I don't care to speculate on that definitively. Okay, thank you. Mr. McCabe? Mark McKay, Precinct 2, I stand to terminate any debate on Article 18 and in any matters therefore. We have motion to terminate debate under Article 18 and all matters thereunder. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it's a two-thirds vote. All right, clickers, ramp it up. All right, we're going to have a vote on, clicker vote on it. One is yes, terminate debate, two is no. Sir. No. <laughs> I've never announced that since I became moderator. I'm not gonna start now. Oh, you have to, all right, go ahead and vote because um, he's gonna leave. We're voting to terminate debate. One yes, two no. He's gonna leave it, he's gonna read. Can you restart it? All right, we're going to do it this way. I'm going to, the old-fashioned way, when it reaches uh, six minutes and 40 seconds, we're done voting. Ready? Go. Vote. One is yes to terminate debate. Two is no. Okay, time up. 107 to 90, it is not terminated. The next on the list was Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I was going to make the same motion as the previous speaker, but I just want to point out that the, uh, the town meeting does not have discretion over this. We are merely deciding whether to endorse this or not. So yes is to, uh, to accept the money. No is not to. That's all it is. Thanks. Ms. Mamone. All right, Serena Memon, Precinct 21. I wanted to know, um, Kevin Greeley, uh, Selectman Greeley, mentioned that uh, 1.4 uh, million uh, dollars was uh, already handed out. But I see on the budget it's 1.273. I was wondering where's the 130 or so. Um, am I just missing the numbers? Dan, Mr. Dunn? Yeah, 
Well, and done, uh, Selectman, uh, and a member of the subcommittee. It's 1.04 okay. is the number that he said, and mm -hmm. so the uh, which so there's two things that we've that we've talked about already tonight that actually combine to make the 1.2. So first you have the 1.04, which is the grant money, and then you have the loans that are being repaid, which is what mm -hmm. we call program income. Mm -hmm. And so we the program income plus the grant is where the 1.2 comes from. Okay. Um. So that's not guaranteed the one of them is or are we counting on the grants or is that i mean are the grants already Granted. guaranteed that's so the, the, word. Yeah, the, the federal money has been awarded okay uh the program income is there's a conservative estimate that we're using we don't know the exact number that we're going to get okay that's that's all i needed right now thank you mr harrington sean steve i mean so um i heard that the, oh, Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I heard that um, someone asked what the project was that the HCA, the Housing Co-op, was doing. And I thought I heard the town manager say that it was 22 Westminster. Uh, Mr. Moderator, is there someone who can tell us whether or not um, a special permit was granted for that as a 40B development? Mr. Chapterlane? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. No special permits for that project have been granted yet, but the Housing Corporation is pursuing uh, permitting under the 40B statute for that Thank project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Weaver. Janice Weaver, Precinct 21. On pages 16 and 17, um, the town hall rental, I was wondering why it doesn't seem to make very much money. And it's rented all the time. I don't understand. I think you got the wrong budget, Janice. Oh, I thought this was on CBG. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I in? You're in. Um... <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, that's, that's okay. for the next one. So Never mind. My, hand, my hand's up for 19. Never mind. <laughs> uh, Mr. Smith. Okay, Mr. McCabe, second time. He gets five minutes this time. Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate any debate on Article 18 and all matters before it. Second. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No, no. It is a two-thirds vote, and I so declare it. We have before us the recommended uh, vote of the Board of Selectmen that we endorse their vote. You ready? So here we go. And the clock is up. Go ahead. One is yes, two is no. Vote one for yes, two for no to endorse Hundred and ninety in the affirmative, fourteen in the negative, it's a positive vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article eighteen and moves us on to Article nineteen, revolving funds. That's where your choice was. Weber? Weber. Sorry about that, the eyesight's going. Um so anyway, back to page 16 and 8 and 17. I was just wondering why the receipts, um, why the balance of the town hall rental seems so low because it's rented constantly and it just seems, the expenditures seem rather high to me and I just was wondering why. Mr. Um, Flanagan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Andrew Flanagan, Deputy Town Manager. Um, with regard to town hall rental revenue or receipts in FY14, um, we had uh, a down year. We were five to seven events 
uh, off what our average is. And uh, with some events, they are charged setup time and cleanup time, so a, an event could be 8, 10, 12 hours. Sometimes they actually last over several days. Uh, I'm pleased to report that in FY15, uh, we're set to have a banner year with uh, projected revenue to exceed $80,000, which will mark uh, our highest year over the past three. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, ma'am? Okay. Stephen Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I had a question on the, um, so I look at the revolving funds and I just go to the big ones, right? And there's only really two big ones here. And uh, the biggest by far is uh, life support services. And uh, for people who were on town meeting last year, I pointed out that, um, that this is actually has to do with our relationship with Armstrong Ambulance. And Armstrong Ambulance actually services the town in two ways. They provide um, ALS services, advanced life support, and the town usually covers with basic life support. And, um, and the split in the contract is a 60-40 split. And if you look at Medicare, you'll see that Medicare has less than 60% of all calls are for advanced life support. What that means is that if an insurance company or Medicare is gonna reimburse you for the expense of a service, they only do it about 60% of the time for advanced life support, even if you had advanced life support there. And so in addition to that, Armstrong is also our billing agent at 3%. And so if you take this number, you look at the beginning and ending balances, you subtract it out, you put in the receipts and compare it to the expenses, it works out to 63%. And so what that says, and this is gonna be a little bit hard to follow because it's not so easy to follow, is that we are paying on every call a reimbursement to Armstrong Ambulance for advanced life support. And we're not getting reimbursed for it. And we should care because, you know, conservative estimate, it's about $200,000. And so I have a question, Mr. Moderator. Sir? Uh, who negotiates that contract? Uh, Mr. Chaplain, is that oh, Mr. Flanagan? <coughs> Andrew Flanagan, Deputy Town Manager. Um, so we've had a, a relatively uh, long-standing relationship with Armstrong Ambulance um, with regard to both a aspects that uh, were mentioned by uh, Mr. Harrington for both billing services, which uh, are 3% off the top of all of our revenue, and then uh, for ALS service, um, which is, as he mentioned, a 60-40 split uh, in terms of the calls. So, um, <clears throat> so with regard to how we've uh, contracted uh, historically with Armstrong, uh, Ambulance services are exempt from uh, most procurement laws. Um, we have had the advantage, a long-standing advantage, of having a um, very well-regarded uh, ambulance company in our hometown, um, directly across the street from the community safety building on Mystic Street. Um, we've been very satisfied both um, with the quality of the service and, uh, secondly, uh, with the quality service to our residents and uh, with the revenue uh, we've been able to generate as a result of that agreement. Um, for any more detail regarding uh, uh, Armstrong's performance uh, through the moderator, I defer to uh, Chief Def Jefferson. So I didn't answer the question. Was um, who, who negotiates the contract? Uh, the, town, the town manager's office, with input from the expertise of uh, uh, Chief Jefferson, who uh, oversees uh, all EMS uh, responsibilities. So, Mr. Moderator, when is that contract up? When do we renew? We uh, just re-upped uh, the contract, so uh, how many we're years? under agreement, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, for the next three. So, two years. Yeah. So, three years. So it's a bad deal. It's $200,000 that should go into the fire department budget. I don't care that we have a great relationship with a vendor. There's no way should you have a vendor be your billing agent, too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wish to discuss the revolving fund budgets? Chief Jefferson. Bob Jefferson, Fire Chief. 
I'd just like to correct some of the information that Mr. Harrington gave you that I believe to be incorrect. Um, he's correct about the splits and he's correct about uh, Armstrong being our billing agent and uh, that they do do our ALS. When Medicare only pays a certain percentage, <coughs> we only pay Armstrong that certain percentage. So as though Mr. Harrington makes it sound as though we're only getting 63% of that run, that's incorrect. We only pay Armstrong 60% of whatever we collect for an ALS, an advanced life support run. We pay them 3% for the overall billing of all of our calls, BLS and ALS. That is well below the um, standard or the, or the fee that's charged to most other cities and towns. Most cities and towns are paying over 4%. We pay them 60% for a paramedic service that they provide to us that costs the town nothing else. They have a, an, a paramedic unit in town to serve the citizens of Arlington 24-7 and charge the town of Arlington nothing. When they respond and when we transport a patient, they are entitled to compensation. It is a very fair and normal arrangement we have with them for 60 to 40%. We get 100% of the revenue when we do a BLS transport, and when it's a BLS transport and Medicare's paying, yeah, we get about 60% of what we may bill because that's what Medicaid pays us. There's nothing in this contract or in the service that the citizens of the town that Arlington are receiving that is unethical or not the best service you're ever going to get. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ciano? Oh, here he is. Thank you. Good job uh, walking up front. Frank Ciano, Precinct 15. I've received um, uh, uh, queries, questions from people. When, if ever, will we receive or get back our Patriots Day parade? And I wonder if from this fund or another fund, uh, that could be funded in the future. Well, that would be under one of the other budgets, but I think it's gonna be next year, Adam. Maybe. We need people to donate. Adam Chapman, Town Manager. Uh, uh, the committee has been reformed with the goal of uh, having the Patriots Day Parade come back next year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions under the revolving fund budgets? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. Yeah, the recommended vote of the Board of, of, the, um, board of Selectmen. I believe it's a two-thirds vote. Ready and vote. One yes, two no. Ooh, what was that noise? One hundred ninety nine, the affirmative, four in the negative. It is a Two-third vote, and I so to clear it. A positive vote. That ends Article 19 and brings us to Article 20. Mr. F Mr. Tosti. Last Monday, there was a uh, sheet handed out with all the collective bargaining on it. Um, we are within one union uh, of having an agreement with all of the town's unions. Uh, under the jurisdiction of the town manager. Uh, the last one is meeting uh, tomorrow to see if they can uh, wrap that up and get that set. Therefore, um, I, I think it's worthwhile waiting till Monday so we can have them all done uh, and set. Therefore, uh, I move that this article, Article 20, be tabled. We have a motion to table Article 20 till Monday, May 11th. I'll, it's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is so tabled. Tabled 511. That brings us to Article 21. Position reclassification. Um, we have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee to reclassify whole bunch of positions. Anybody have any questions about position reclassification? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. A 
All set? Oh, there is a, Zarina does have a question, sorry. You can get it up ready anyways. Miss Mamone. Zarina Memon, Precinct 21. I'm not so sure what these new positions, the MEO3, what does that stand for, MEO? Mr. Chapdelaine, can you decipher your indecipherable letters? Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager, Motor Equipment Operator. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, cool. And those are new positions. So a lot of those are, others are similar, it looks like, um, from the ones that are being deleted, except they're being upgraded. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions on position reclassification? Seeing none. Mr. Renault? Okay, one is yes, two is no, and go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. We have 199, the affirmative, zero is negative. It is unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That ends Article 21 and brings us to Article 22, Appropriation Town Budgets. Mr. Tosti. Oh, do you want me to go through and do the holds first? You want to say something? You want to introduce them? Okay. Okay, the, the town budgets are now, are now before you. Um, there's going to be a couple of changes uh, in, the, uh, in the whole scope. You'll see it in Public Works, creating a new department, uh, which the manager can talk to you a little bit more in detail. We're also uh, making some transitions in public safety that you'll see certain things, certain budgets will simply drop off uh, the charts next year. Uh, contracts are up as at the end of this year. Um, I think we had two years of zero contract raises, and then in fiscal 14, we had 3%, oh, sorry, fiscal 13, 3%, fiscal 14, 275, and fiscal 15, 275. Uh, so those are all built in. Uh, the basic increases that you see uh, are for steps, um, for the most part, and um, uh, you'll see the, the contract raises that we do later on Monday, uh, you'll see those next year. Um, and the uh, Finance Committee and Department heads uh, stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, we're going <clears> to. <throat> right, we're going to do the budgets that we have in, as we have in the past years. I'm going to go through and call off the names of the various departmental budgets. If someone wishes to discuss that budget, yell out hold. If no one yells out hold and holds a budget, then we are going to not discuss that later on. So, if you want to discuss one of the budgets, say hold. Finance Committee. Board of Selectmen. Town Manager. Human Resources. Information Technology. Comptroller. Treasurer Collector. Postage. Board of Assessors, Legal, Town Clerk, Board of Registrars, Parking, Planning Community Development, Redevelopment Board, Zoning Board of Appeals, Public Works, <coughs> Facilities, <coughs> Community Safety, <coughs> Inspections, Education, libraries, health and human services, retirement, 
insurance, reserve fund, water and sewer. I think these are now enterprise funds, water and sewer as a whole. Recreation. Ed Burns Arena. Council on Aging Transport. Youth Services. And that's it. Okay, we're going to go back to the beginning, the first budget that was held. was Board of Selectmen. Who wanted to hold that? Okay, the Harrington twins. Mr. Harrington, Stephen first, then Sean. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, so, Mr. Moderator, the Board of Selectmen as a department, um, who do they report to? Um, you know, the personnel and, uh, and who does the um, elections and town meeting um, ex personnel services and expenses report through? Um, Mr. Greeley is going to address it, but the Board of Selectmen report to us, the voters. He's going to address for the rest of his department. Yes, sir. Uh, what was the rest of it, Mr. Harrington? So um, the Board of Selectmen, the, the personnel and the expenses all report through the Board of Selectmen or the chair? The board, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, um, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to point out that um, in other towns, um, for instance, uh, Belmont, and in Winchester, uh, there actually isn't a separate line item. It's under the town manager or the town administrator, Belmont's case. And there's a reason for that. It's professional management. We saw the other night, you know, professional management matters. And it's, um, it's actually a pretty large part of the budget. And nowhere could I find, like, that elections were under the Board of Selectmen. And so in other towns, and I didn't do a comprehensive list, but I looked, you know, half a dozen, and so if you look at like Lexington, Lexington does have a line item in their budgets for the Board of Selectmen. It's two FTEs on a budget much larger than ours. And um, you know, it, it sort of makes sense. That's, you know, it's the two people who work in the office. But this is a, you know, just, a, and this is a comment that I think that it would be best if we looked at these budgets and the departments over the long term. And we th said to ourselves, why are we having so many different department level budgets? I mean, I didn't put a hold on postage, but do we, you know, what's, why isn't that under like the town manager? Why isn't the board of selectmen employees under professional management? And I think that it would actually help a lot in driving efficiencies for the town, as well as making a little bit easier job for everyone to know what the costs are of certain services. And it's general government. That's how most other towns seem to handle this, is under a general government category. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, for me to understand that, you know, we have um, you know, one, two, three, four and a half people for five elected officials, part-time, officials. So, you know, and, and God bless them, I love them all. It's not that there's an issue with them. I think Mr. Greeley's going to tell you why our budgets are developed I, the way they are. There wasn't a question. I didn't ask you any did, question. I think there was can, a question there. You can there. talk later. Um, so I, I'd like to say that I think that, and I'm not picking on this, like I said, postage. You could go through this. There's at least a half a dozen times, but the Board of Selectmen one, it's, it's, geez, it's bigger than almost any other line item other than the big three. It's bigger than education. So in terms of just the detail and, and the extent, and I think it evolved that way. And I think that, you know, uh, maybe it's through the town meeting procedures or maybe it's the finance committee. Um, I think that we owe it to ourselves to go through and change the way these department level budgets uh, put together. And I think we owe it to the employees of the town whenever we can to seek that they have professional management. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sean Harrington. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Um, I'm assuming that this would be the department to talk about with um, elections and what have you. I was curious if the Board of Selectmen have looked at the possibility of changing um, or the cost difference between changing elections from a Saturday to a Tuesday. I have. Have you so examined that? Mr. Tosti? Oh. Anyone really, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, uh, the, the Board of Selectmen, the elections has always been under the uh, Board of Selectmen, uh, working with the town clerk and the Board of Selectmen can change the, uh, the day uh, and the date that, they, that we have the elections. But has anyone looked at the, fee, at the co possible um, difference in cost and co savings by changing it? Mr. Greeley? Uh, yes, we have. I can't tell you that we've done this this year, but the problem with the Tuesday elections has been that schools are in session at that time, and uh, so there's multiple problems with trying to hold it on a Tuesday as well with uh, the number of police details and the rest of it, which is easier on a Saturday. And we felt it's more convenient for people, but I can't give you cost comparison. All right. Could you? Okay, yeah, it's primarily the schools are open. Okay, well, I mean, we have our November elections on Tuesdays, and a lot of towns and cities are seeming to move, or towns specifically are moving to this. My friend Patrick Reynolds, a selectman down in North Attleboro, has been trying to move, trying to move, as he said, elections toward the 21st century. Um, also, is it my understanding that, the, um, from what I understand also, the town clerk's office who I love, I adore the town clerk's office, and most of the people that work at town are all of them, actually. I don't want to get in trouble there. Um, basically, from what I gather, after a certain period of time, we're paying them overtime, especially on a, actually all, all day on Saturday because they're not supposed to work that day. So we're paying them overtime all those hours. If it was a regular work day, I'm imagining that we would be paying them only a smaller bit of that. I don't know what the cost savings would be, but it'd be nice if we actually looked at this and potentially moved toward, uh, moved toward looking at this more and the feasibility and kind of moving our elections toward the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Greeley, you had your hand up. Did you want to speak? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just wanted to clarify this. Three and a half uh, personnel in, in the uh, Board of Selectmen and the amount of work that those three and a half uh, turn out on behalf of you, the citizens of Arlington, is astounding, and it is, in my opinion, one of the lowest staffed offices throughout Town Hall. But when you consider calling, for example, this warrant and having to get this warrant to all of the people in the Town of Arlington running each of the elections, uh, all of the parking issues throughout the Town of Arlington, all of the licenses throughout the Town of Arlington, so there's quite a bit of work. Uh, they should be congratulated for what a great job they do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Peluso. I'm a little bit confused as to what uh, this conversation is about. Uh, it's what? Oh, my name is Ted Peluso, I'm in precinct number six, but I am confused about this conversation. Uh, I thought we were voting on a budget, and whether, it seems to me, whether you're gonna change departments, or whether you're gonna consolidate departments, or whether you're gonna change reporting routines, that sounds like a warrant to me. That doesn't sound like a budget. So uh, I would like very much, because I'm used to being in bed at eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I would like very much that you possibly consider whether comments like that are really out of order. That has nothing to do with the budget. It has to do who reports to who. Now I should also point out one other thing which I found was astonishing, okay? This town has 10% less employees per capita than most other towns. 
This town also has, it was from the master plan, uh, Stephen. Uh, this town also has, uh, spends approximately 10% less per capita than most other towns. That's a quote from the individuals who prepared the master plan. Now, obviously, we can get into where we spend too much money and too little money, but we should kind of keep in mind what the overall picture is. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Slickman. Paul Slickman. Paul Slickman, uh, chair of the school committee. Uh, I just wanted to answer in response to Mr. Harrington's question uh, regarding the use of schools on Tuesdays. When we have a Tuesday election for a national or state election on an even numbered year, uh, we traditionally have a professional development day and do not bring children into the building uh, because uh, of safety concerns. This is common to many school districts um, in that uh, when you have a large number of voters coming into the building, sometimes they wander into places in the building which is not appropriate while children are there. So. Um, it, it, you know, it, there is an expense to the school department or a cost in terms of time to, to hold elections uh, on a Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bergloo. Uh, Mr. Deist. John Deist, Precinct 13. I'm uh, going to react to Mr. Peluso's comment about uh, questioning with regard to the budgets. After sitting in town meeting for many, many years, I've come to the conclusion that it's sort of the one time when a town meeting member can actually ask a question about a particular department. Uh, there is sort of no other appropriate way that one can do that. Um, and so I, I would respectfully suggest that the way we're doing it right now works pretty well and we shouldn't change it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments under the Selectman's budget? Seeing none, we'll take up the next budget after the break. Thank you. See you in a few minutes. Precinct 9 by the back table, please.
Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Revelock, Precinct 1. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I'm sure somebody asks every year, but this is my first year here, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, the town manager section of the budget contains a line item called Water Sewer Enterprise Fund. Um, what is that and how is the amount uh, calculated? Mr. Tosti, please take your personal conversations outside, out in the front hall, please, so we can hear the questions. Go ahead, Mr. Tosti. The Water Sewer is an enterprise fund, uh, and its job is to, to raise enough revenue to cover all its expenses. Most of the, overwhelmingly, most of the expenses are direct expenses. But there's also indirect expenses because other departments provide services to those, to the water and sewer enterprise funds. So, for example, the treasurer collector, they send out the bills. Oh. So they have a charge there. Uh, and, a, and the controller keeps track of it. So there's an enterprise there. And obviously, the manager has responsibilities over a very large budget. So there's a charge there. So that's where it comes from. Okay, thank you. And you'll see when you get to the water and sewer, there will be indirect charges. And all those together total that number. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, also there is a line item on a number of uh, sub-budgets called longevity. Um, what is that, what is longevity and how is that calculated? Basically it's an employee survival reward. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so if, if you manage to last, um, I think the first one is five years, you know, there's a, there's a longevity step, and if you last 10 years, and if you last 20 years, there's a, there's a step there. So that's what longevity is. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. There's a lot of personal chatter going on near the back of the hall. I can hear it up here. Please keep it down and take those ch conversations outside. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Can we throw up my slide, Eve? So the slide that you're looking at behind you is a review of um, the projection of the stable override stabilization fund over the course of all the years since we passed the override in 2011. The first line is um, what we promised the voters in 2011. You'll see that the green line is what happened when we were able to um, move our employees into the GIC and gained a $3 million reset on our health care costs. And then you'll see the next years, because we had better experience on our health care costs than expected, we continued to sort of bend the curve upward and outward. Okay. So this year, um, where we're now projecting that we will hit um, the red, as it were, in 2021, um, is due to the kind of adjustments that the Finance Committee declared at the beginning of the um, town meeting. 3%, changing the growth rate that we allow on the budget to 3%, and adjusting the growth rate for health care. Okay. So you'll notice that on this slide, I refer to the financial, the five-year financial document that we use as a projection, not a plan. And that's because that's what it is. It is a financial projection, not a plan. If you look at the town manager's budget message and you read a section from a single department, you will discover that in there, there is a section for each department on their accomplishments in 2014, that was last year, and their goals and objectives for 2016. Presumably there's a relationship between their goals and objection, objectives for 2016 and their budget. So presumably when Chief Ryan says that he's gonna fully implement ComStat, he's added to his budget, employee time, cost of software, possibly a consultant, whatever it is he needs to do to do that implementation so that he can achieve that goal. We don't have goals and objectives for 2017, 18, 19, 20, or 21. If you look in the master plan, you'll discover that there is a section on public facilities and resources, and you will see that there's a bunch of recommended steps in the master plan. So for example, it's recommended that we perform a space needs analysis for all town-owned buildings that we establish a planned preventative maintenance program, 
and that we assess the condition of private ways, and that we study and develop a plan for addressing Arlington's long-term public works related needs. We're about to change the limit, uh, the cost containment limit on our budget to 3% a year without having done any of that planning. I'm concerned that we're making a decision here to further constrain the budget in the absence of some critical information. The five-year financial projection is a box. We concern ourselves a great deal with the size of the box and spend too little time talking publicly about whether or not the box will hold the contents the residents want to see in it. In order to understand whether or not the decision to reduce the growth rate is a good idea, we need to understand the goals and objectives that underlie the five-year projection. Presumably, the town manager, superintendent of schools, and the department heads got together and went through a planning exercise to consider the challenges and opportunities and risks we may face as a community over the next five to seven years and assess the resources required to meet those challenges, take advantage of the opportunities, and mitigate the risks before agreeing that a 3% growth rate is achievable. This should have resulted in a written plan similar to the master plan that shows that the resources projected on the financial plan will be adequate. Through you, Mr. Moderator, to the town manager, was such an exercise done, and can the results in written form be shared with the town meeting and the residents of the town? Mr. Chapdelaine, did you perform such an analysis? <clears throat> Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So uh, I suppose w what I would say is when the override was passed in 2011, the, the major promises, at least for town services I'll speak to, uh, was the maintenance of a level uh, of current service levels. Uh, on, on top of that, uh, in terms of assertions about no forward planning, town meeting has already adopted a five-year forward-thinking capital plan earlier in this session. Mm -hmm. The town has adopted and is in the middle of implementing a three-year IT strategic plan mm -hmm. focused uh, on department-by-department uh, department innovations in terms of the implementation of technology. Uh, and annually, the Board of Selectmen meets with me in a goal-setting session in which we set operational goals uh, and stretch goals for the next two years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think we have a multi-layered goal-setting approach uh, that looks as far as five years and, and as near-term as uh, every two years when we meet annually. Um, so to, to the specific question of was an exercise done and documented in regards to whether or not 3% um, would maintain level services, uh, what I would say is in the town side of the operation, uh, more mm -hmm. than two-thirds uh, of the town budgets combined are personnel related. Uh, so we take a focus when we uh, begin collective bargaining with the unions mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we execute contracts that can live within whatever the fiscal constraints are that the long range plan has set forth. Uh, and then with, within that, uh, year over year, we do plan to at the very least maintain services and if there is the ability to expand or adapt services, mm -hmm. we, we do that. Um, that said, um, I think a trend we see nationwide that I certainly see here in Arlington is a growing gap between service level expectation of residents and what is actually capable within uh, the fiscal realities of not just Arlington, but uh, both localities and states across the nation. Uh, so I, I do think going forward that there's certainly a benefit at looking what our current service levels are, what we can afford uh, w within the plan, within the constraints that the plan puts forward, and whether or not there needs to be a further conversation, conversation about changing those constraints. Thank you. So I don't have time for my last thought other than to say that I hope that the town manager will put this plan into writing and present it to the town meeting along with the budgets in the future and that the long range planning committee will concentrate on what's in the box, not just the walls of the box. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tosti. Uh, just a couple thoughts, obviously. Uh, the last speaker was concerned with the long-range plan that's in the Finance Committee book that I went through uh, on the first night of town meeting um, on, the, on the budgets and how much they grow and such like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I was the one that pushed that we need to slow down the rate of growth uh, if we're going to uh, be able to have a long-term solution uh, to our town, to our budgets, uh, and to the, to the citizens. 
And the one thing, you know, first of all, we're living in a 2% inflation period. Uh, and we've been allowing 3.5% growth. And I think we pushed that's got to come down a little bit. Uh, and, and that's what the, the uh, plan that the manager put together and, uh, with the long-term planning committee and the budget and revenue task force does. I think it's very reasonable. Um, secondly, it's not just the budgets. Um, we have got a rebuild of the high school in the wings, both Arlington High School and possibly Minuteman High School. So we've got some other major needs out there. And the one entity that sometimes gets ignored in all of these discussions is the taxpayer. We have to put together a budget and a series uh, and, and the revenues that support it that the taxpayer can afford. Uh, and, and that's what I think all of the town leaders have been trying to do. Uh, because we're going to be hitting the taxpayer with those three items over the next five years. And, and we've got to be you know, reasonable with how much how much they can afford. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Deist. John Deist, Precinct 13, a member of the Finance Committee. Um, I guess I want to point out the vagaries of life, so to speak, which is to say, one can create plans out as many years as one likes, and in most instances, nothing that you talk about in many of those plans, or most of what you talk about in those plans, simply does not happen. Who would have predicted that we were going to have a $2.2 million uh, snow budget this year, for example? Who will be able to predict what, what the evolution of global warming is really going to be on this town in the future. My point is that you can do planning over a short time, but it's a waste of effort and money to do it for too long a time. Trying to plan out many, many years doesn't really make any sense, and it wastes people time and money. I think we have kind of the right balance right now between the the what Ms. LaCourt did not call a plan, but we all call a five-year plan, and what is reality and what we can anticipate for the future. Thank you very much. Ms. LaCourt, you had your hand up for a second time. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. I would just like to respond to what my good friends, Al Tosti and John Teist, just um, said in rebuttal to my argument. So the first thing that I would like to say is that the taxpayers are also the citizens receiving the package of services that we deliver. Yes, we want to consider the taxpayer. They are also the people who have children in our schools, who our ambulances respond to, who play in our parks, who need to get down our streets to their jobs. We also want to know what services they want and what they're willing to pay for them. That's why we hold overrides. Prop two and a half is the best thing since sliced bread for getting everybody to focus on what's going on with the budget and to allow the citizens to periodically vote for a reset. We're about to do a reset without taking a vote. We don't know what the residents think. We don't know if they want their property tax bill protected or they want services they're not receiving or they want a different mix of services because we haven't done the exercise of asking them. We've made an assumption. In terms of Mr. Dite's criticism of planning, yes, almost never does a plan that starts in year one wind up exactly where you expected it to in year five but you have no idea where you are going if you don't have a plan and you have no way to correct a course if you don't have a course. It's never a waste of time and money to create a plan. This is what in scenery reconstruction we used to call measure twice, cut once. So I would like to suggest that we need to undergo this planning exercise. What we need to do is ensure that the planning exercise is as lightly held as is implied by the distance out. Let me give you a specific example of what I'm talking about. 
Right now, the Arlington Education Foundation is raising $50,000 to put a digital arts lab into the high school. This is not in the budget because five years ago, nobody sat down and said, what do we need to be teaching our students in 2015? What they said is, how do we fit inside the box we've been given? We need to be able to think about where we need to be in some period of time. Now, I don't mind raising the money, and all of you are welcome to hit the AEF website and contribute, okay? But what I mind is that we needed a digital arts lab two years ago, not now. There's 1,000, 10,000 jobs going, begging in Silicon Valley that use those course, skills and we're not training our students. That's not the manager's budget now. Okay, but you understand my point. Yeah. That if we're not thinking forward and we're not planning and all we're doing is creating constraints on our budget, we are going to miss something and it could be something critical. In the schools, it might not be critical to our public safety, but certainly in community safety and DPW, it will be. Thank you. Mr. Veraglu. Mustafa Varaglu, uh, Precinct 10. So first I'd like to uh, second, and um, I'm thankful that Diane Mahan came up twice. This was a question I had when we had our, um, our uh, uh, precinct organization, or our precinct sort of information meetings. I was surprised to hear that we were short, um, uh, trimming the rate of growth, and I had questions about the idea that there should be tension on both sides of these things. We definitely have a tension from the money side, and I would like to have a tension from the idea of what the residents um, want, expect, for the money that they already spend, and are they getting that or not. Um, I don't really have a solution per se. I, I, though I, I, my question, I guess, was what was, you know, has that side been considered? Um, and then the other thing I would like to just point out in this, um, in, this sh in the shrinking, or the shrinking of the rate of growth, we're still growing. The town, de uh, has it been considered, is the town demographic changing? I mean, we all see the people that we are most immediately connected to in life. In my life right now, it is school-aged children, so I see new families moving in. I mean, are we in a, you know, maybe the town population is not growing very much, the town population is growing, but the housing stock is not growing. But are the service needs different in the next 10 years, likely to be different in the next 10 years? And are we going to grow in a direction or have demands in a direction? that will be um, fulfilled at this rate. And you know, we all have constraints. There should be tension on both sides. Do we have adequate tension from both sides? And I'm, I'm sorry, it's, I don't usually like to ask these sort of philosophical questions. Um, I, I like just like data. But um, it does bother me that um, I don't feel as much tension as I would like from the side of will the services that we may expect from my view of all I see of the people I interact with the most that I see growing dramatically, extra class sizes, for new families moving into town. Will there be those services provided to them five years out at this rate of growth, at the level and the quality that we have currently? And I think the one thought I do have that I want to share is, um, you know, the worst thing to do is spend a lot of money and not get what you think you're getting. Then you're really bitter about the quality of government. You lose faith in the system. If you feel you're spending good money for good value, whatever that measure is, and if you have to spend more to get the value so you actually get something that's worth it, that should be a discussion so people should decide that value that they want and what they're willing to spend for it. Yeah. I'm not sure there's a question in there, but good. Did you, was that an actual question or statement? Statement. Okay, good, perfect. Mr. Swilling? Nathan Swilling, Precinct 6. I move to, to terminate debate on budgets 3 through 16. 3 through 16? We just have a hold on number 3 at this moment. The yeah, okay, is a motion to terminate debate on 3 through 16, several of which are held. All in favor, please say yes. Oh, no one seconded. Is there a second? No second. All right. No, no one seconded, Mr. Swilling. Sorry. There is no one else who wishes to discuss the manager budget. You want to discuss the manager budget? Okay. Uh, 
that was really interesting. And Jen, uh, EJ Harris, Precinct 5, I apologize. Um, that was really interesting and I think genuinely worth the consideration of the entire meeting. The only thought I wanted to share is it turns out we do elect, we, we do ask the town what they want every year because they elect us to answer that question when we vote on the budget and we dutifully do so. Um, if we actually aren't a body that answers that question, I don't know why I'm here. Thank you. Anyone else on the manager's budget? Okay, that closes the debate on the manager budget. The next budget was held was the treasurer. Who wished to discuss the treasurer? The Jameson. On the manager budget, I let it go um, off the budget because we have to have somewhere to discuss these issues. Um, I was originally one of the original persons who got up asking me where they could discuss these issues, and I said the manager because he's kind of in charge, and if there was nowhere else to discuss it, we wouldn't have had that conversation. I think it was a good conversation. But on the rest of the budgets, let's keep it to the actual department we're discussing, if you please. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Mr. And, and thank you, the Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12, and uh, thank you for informing us for future meetings when we might make those um, important discussions. Yep, manager, because I can grill him. Um, so uh, the other night when uh, we were doing the capital plan, there was an item for the treasurer's office. It was a new software package, and uh, so that was a couple hundred thousand dollars that was potentially going to be spent and there's, uh, I also uh, talked to Mr. Good, and there's a software programmer that spends significant time uh, man uh, helping the current system uh, survive. Um, immediately, I thought of um, outsourcing. Why buy this package? Why continue to have someone who has to program to keep the packages alive? And so my question to the treasurer's office is, um, are they considering outsourcing of this package, the billing and receipts and things, uh, sorted things, and if not, why not? Okay, Mr. Gillig is in here, but his deputy treasurer is where? Oh, you're over there hiding. Come on over. I'm looking at Stephen's chair. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Michael Morse, deputy treasurer. Um, in regards to the outsourcing, we do outsource some of it with Lockbox currently. That's a separate facility where some bill payments get processed. I think he's um, referring to the software I mean, I, I package was, itself. I was trying to the yeah. software that um, it, all, it all ties in. Excuse me. Okay. Um, Microphone. We've looked at a number of different software programs out there. We have a IT consultant coming in to do a needs analysis from the office, and we'll use that recommendation um, as we go forward with the IT software budget that we have. Yeah, that doesn't address my question about: Are you considering outsourcing the whole thing? This would seem to well, be a, a, we'll a, a de demarcation. Um, uh, uh, and so when next year comes along, and if you have purchased the package versus outsourcing, um, I, would, I would expect the office to be uh, able to respond to uh, in detail why uh, an outsourcing approach was not utilized versus keeping it in-house. I understand there's, there's professional reasons within the office to keep it one place or else, but I think we'd like to hear about the rationale for going one way or the other. Sure. Well, the IT consultant that we do have coming in in the next few months will do a full needs analysis, and he will go through the different um, opportunities and options that we have, including outsourcing and all the other local um, software vendors out there. Excellent. Thank you, much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to discuss the treasurer's budget? Seeing none. The next budget that was held, Board of Assessors. Who wish to discuss Board of Assessors? Pass. No one else? Legal. Who wanted to discuss legal? Mr. Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go into actually expenses here. So I have a question, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we heard the other night that $50,000 was spent on uh, defending the town against a lawsuit. And so I went to the open checkbook which is a great tool, you should look at it. And um, I look back, and it has data back to June of 2011, fiscal year 212. And um, I could find nothing that indicated that an outside law firm was paid um, for 
that legal expense that we were told about by a, another speaker. So my question, Mr. Moderator, is, I guess it would be, um, where, when did we spend that 50000 and who was the vendor that we spent it on? What was the legal firm that we spent that money on? Mr. Heim? <coughs> Doug Heim, Town Council. So uh, there are certain things, uh, while the town is for the most part self-insured, there are certain right. things the town can't be self-insured, so we have what's called a, an officers and liability policy. Right. So that money is a deductible on an insurance policy. The insurance policy then takes, absorbs whatever it is, the cost is, whether we win or we lose, and they hire the outside firm. That's why you won't see it in open checkbook, because we didn't hire a firm, we paid our insurance deductible. So I should see that insurance deductible then, right? In the open checkbook? Uh, you know, I'm not sure, uh, that, was, that was some years ago, I'm not sure how the open checkbook handles something like an insurance deductible. Um, I have to refer that to somebody else, but. Chaplain. Adam Chaplain, Town Manager. Uh, I believe council is uh, means to say premium uh, when he's saying deductible, and, and those insurance premiums are covered under the insurance budget. And so every year, I, I believe it's uh, delineated in the insurance budget public officials liability, and that would be the insurance premium that's being referenced. So um, bear with me, can we look at the insurance budget quickly, since it seems to you know, be a crossover from the legal budget? Well, as long as we don't discuss it again under insurance. I don't believe anyone held insurance, sir. Well, we never know. So I'm looking at under insurance on page B15. So about halfway down the chart, you'll see group life and then liability insurance. Right. That liability insurance is what uh, town council was referring to as a uh, public officials uh, liability insurance. Yeah, so it's, it's steady since 2013. So that would have been steady since fiscal year 2013. Correct. And so the, um, the person uh, that they referred to, and you'll see it's, it's, it's steady, 50, 50, 55, 55. There's no unusual expense. Uh, that person was deposed in 2013. So I don't see it in there. I don't see that it was an increase of a $50,000 cost to the town. I made no such claim. Okay, I didn't say you did, sir. Thank you. Anyone else on legal? Seeing none. Next was parking. Who wanted to discuss parking? Richard. Richard Langone, Precinct 6. Um, I'm curious about overnight parking. It seems to be um, <clears throat> certain areas that there are overnight parking and certain areas there ain't. Is there a policy for overnight parking? Mr. Greeley, the selectmen are in charge of parking. Mr. Greeley is going to tell you. <clears throat> Kevin Greeley, Board of Selectmen. Um, actually, yes, there is a policy, and it uh, normally relates to whether or not um, there is an ability for uh, a driveway on the property or whatever, and we listen. We determine it on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm wondering if it's enforced throughout the whole town, or is it, the reason I ask is there's 80, roughly 80 people in the town that have overnight parking permits. I noticed uh, every time someone comes up for an overnight parking permit the in the selectman's office, they have to beg and plead and, you know, for every kind of reason to why they should have overnight parking. And <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that when they had the ballot question in 2013, you know, they asked if the town agreed that there should be overnight parking. Well, one third of the town is private parking, private ways. So they wouldn't even know what overnight parking is. So when the selectmen always tell the people that come up and ask for a permit to overnight park, they always say to them, well, look, it was overwhelmingly voted against. Well, overwhelmingly, what would one third of the town that has private ways know about overnight parking? It doesn't apply to them. They're exempt from it. They can park overnight all they want. They have guests can park overnight all they want. 
<clears throat> so overnight parking is a, a gray area. They enforce it on certain people, and at the same time they're enforcing on certain people, they allow 26 parking spots in front of the, the um, <clears throat> high school for town employees. Now, I'm a taxpayer, and I have to pay to overnight park in front of my house, which I don't have a driveway for. I live in the center. The center is, you know, a tough area to live because there's a lot of business, a lot of people going to be coming in and out. And I can understand parking rules, semi-enforcement, gray areas, but it's insulting to me that I have to pay to park overnight when town employees, who I pay taxes to employ, get a different privilege. Not only do they get to park in front of the high school, but the students who certain select people said, I don't want to listen to the, the parents if they start ticketing around the high school. But they got no problem ticketing a small street like Swan Place, who's beside the kickstand restaurant, who personally, the front of it looks beautiful, but the back side of it's a dump. There's dumpsters and trash all over the place. Personally, there comes a point when, you know, our police department should be defending and protecting all the people. And when they came after Swan Place, they were going on the orders of the selectmen, which I filed a public meeting request with the Attorney General, a violation of the open meeting law complaint. And I'm saying it to you today, and that's what happened. Back in 2012, our town and our selectmen and our police department assaulted our neighborhood. Rich, I don't Richard, plan on coming back Richard. next year. So I'm getting that off my chest now. Thank you. Anyone else on parking? Next is planning and community development. Who wished to speak to that? Sir? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Watson, Precinct 5. Uh, just had a, a, que a couple of questions about line items under uh, personnel and planning and commuting, community development. Uh, there, uh, it appears that for 2016, there's a new assistant director position being funded and a senior planner slash director of housing position being defunded. And my question was, uh, what's happening there? Is that just due to a personnel reorganization? Kowalski? Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning and Community Development. That's correct. Uh, last year, a position was reclassified. The uh, Senior Planner, Director of Housing position was reclassified to Assistant Director. Are, are personnel actually changing? No. The, there is an individual whose title changed. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else on planning and community development? Seeing none. Recreation. Re redevelopment board, someone held that. Who wanted to speak to the redevelopment board? Nobody, okay, moving on. Public works, okay. There's a bunch of people, so hold on a second. You first. Um, oh, yeah, go first. Um, I have a question for the head of the Public Works Department. I don't know if anyone else feels the same way I do. Oh. Uh, Judith uh, Phelps, name Precinct, it, name Precinct though. I don't feel, no, whether other people feel the same way I do, but when I drive through the town of Arlington, I feel like I am driving over a washboard every street I go down. A, the town of Arlington puts down a new street and two weeks later a contractor comes by and tears up a hole in the street. And then the contractor repairs the hole by filling it in. Two weeks later there's a dip where that hole is. I know there is a policy that when a contractor or the DPW tears up a road, they are responsible for putting it back into the condition it was in when they found it. 
Well, right now, they don't have to put it in much of a condition because the condition they're finding the roads is rotten, to say the least. However, I'm wondering how the DPW holds the feet to the fire for these contractors to see that this work is done and if they call them back when two or three weeks later there are holes where the um, fillings were done. Mr. Rademacher. Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, the Public Works does have a policy for any uh, newly paved roads. There is a moratorium on excavation. Uh, but there are obviously times when um, work is still necessary, even in these roads. In that case, we put a, an extra requirement upon the contractor that they, when they patch the road, they have to do what's called an infrared patch, where they actually kind of melt the pavement back in to make a smooth surface. We don't require that to happen until a year after the work is done, because you want some settlement to occur. Uh, then they're required to come back and make that uh, final patch. We do have a, pro a program where we uh, look at permits from years past to be sure that we're following up with this kind of work, and uh, that, that's done on an annual basis, and we do, we do call contractors back in and have them perform this work. Well, if anyone drives around the roads in Arlington, you wouldn't find that you've been calling them back very well, because to be honest with you, I can, I mean, I don't think there's a street in Arlington that I can drive down that I can't find a place where a contractor should have been called back because of the, the washboard that is there. I mean, our roads are in deplorable condition. Thank you. Um, this gentleman, four rows back. Right, yep. You. Right next, yeah, sir. I'll learn everyone's name eventually. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Watson, Precinct 5. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, one, um, under uh, uh, cemeteries, um, there is a, a, what looks like a significant increase uh, under motor equipment operator uh, without an increase in personnel. And uh, I was wondering what was behind that. Rademacher. Uh, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. There was a, a really an adjustment in um, the organization of the, the department. We had a half-time position in cemeteries and a full-time position in parks, and those positions were swapped. So there was an increase in cemeteries, but a decrease in the parks department uh, budget. Okay, and uh, my second question is uh, under uh, sanitation, uh, solid fill disposal. Uh, I just wanted to know what is solid fill disposal and why is it increasing by 21%? Uh, solid fill disposal is w when we need to get material, get rid of material such as pavement or concrete when we redo a roadway or a sidewalk, and it varies depending on the amount of work we get done in a particular year. Okay, thank you. The Trembley. At Trembley Precinct 19, uh, Mr. Moderator is going to ask the annual question. How much salt did we use? John, I have you on the list. Don't worry. Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. This year we used 9,455 tons of salt. It's not too bad. It was actually less than last year. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, is there any, uh, are any plans to use uh, brine? Not, not currently, no. Okay. Um, I was also wondering if, if uh, you had any um, indication of how much snowplow damage we got uh, from running over curbs and bump outs or whatever. I don't, we don't have those kind of records. I mean, um, equipment gets damaged uh, during the course of an event over the course of the winter. Um, we don't necessarily keep tracks on if it was damaged because we hit one particular kind of curb or another. We're, Fixing it, it and getting back out there. 
is, is, is there any, uh, any particular thing that you're aware of that uh, causes the majority of snowplow damage? Uh, well, it's a various things. Roadway condition um, is probably the number one. And, and uh, I would say that we, we do have some difficulties with some of the private ways in town, uh, but we need to, we'll be working to address that with the, with the owners of those private ways. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Fuller. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Uh, question on snow and ice. I see that in the current year, fiscal 15, we budgeted $771,000. Um, on the back summary page, it shows we're filling snow and ice deficit with $500,000 of new money. So that's about, you know, 1.3 million. But according to open checkbook, we spent 2.2 million. So my question is, where did the rest of the money come from to fill in that expense? Mr. Tosti. So another 500,000 will come from the reserve fund, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and the rest of the money will come from transfers within within the other budgets. Within the other public works budgets? Well, within the other town budgets. Okay. Um, is the increase to 846000 for 16? Suppose we have another really bad winter. Is it going to be possible to put that jigsaw puzzle together again to fund a, a big overage if it happens? Uh, that's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to increase that as much as we can. Uh, each year, uh, the reserve fund has been increased to, again, substantially hold that, and uh, I think we can. I mean, whatever has to be done will be done. Okay, well, we'll just hope we don't get another winter like that for a while. That would be Thanks. nice. Um, <laughs> another Chet. question, the oh. state transportation bond bill that was passed a year or two ago uh, earmarked a pretty considerable amount of money for the reconstruction of Gray Street. I was wondering what the status of that might be and when that might actually happen. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, if, if, may I, Mr. Moderator, address one quick point about the snow and ice budgeting? Yeah. Uh, we, uh, the town manager's office has started discussions with the finance committee about trying to get up to the 10-year retrospective average of snow and ice spending, which is just over a million dollars when we look back 10 years. So we're trying to get up towards that within the next several fiscal years. In regards to that Gray Street bond authorization, at this point it's just that. It's a bond authorization uh, passed by the legislature, which would then need to be actually uh, executed or um, issued by the governor's office. Today we have no knowledge that the governor or DOT, Mass DOT, would be looking to issue that. But uh, we somewhat frequently will, will lobby our legislators to, to put a push on that. And uh, if when the opportunities ar arise to have conversations with Mass DOT, we certainly check in. But th there's nothing pending today. Okay, that clears that up. I, I hope it happens sooner or later. That's one of those washboard roads that a previous speaker referenced. Thank you. The one right in front of Mr. Fuller. Did you have to hand up? Oh, over here you did. Okay, great. Hi, Michaela May, Precinct 20. Um, another snow question. I, I remember there was discussion, you know, uh, in the community during the snow fiasco about um, removal of snow on properties that, on sidewalks where they just sort of chronically weren't removed. There was a, there's a business on Mass Ave close to the Lexington border that habitually doesn't remove it such that you can't walk down the hill to Starbucks. There's a, some, you know, properties in town where um, there is not snow removal throughout the, um, the season. And I was wondering, um, I, I saw in the by bylaws that the town has the power to remove snow um, on certain properties, and I'm wondering if that is done, private properties. Mr. Rodemar, could you shovel anyone's private properties? No. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not suggesting that you should. I'm just saying, uh, you know, and, and we've, you know, there, there's been, you know, community discussions on how to address this problem because for a lot of people in the community, it makes it so that they're stuck at home, you know, because they either they can't walk in their neighborhood or, 
um, you know, someone falls, they can't go to work. And for a lot of people, you know, it, it just creates a cascading effect. So, um, you know, I was just curious to know whether anything is done about if that was done. Because um, I know it's in the bylaws. Would it be Public Works that did it, or would it be? Because I know the police enforce the tickets. And I'm not saying the police actually, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. I, be I believe the bylaw you're referring to uh, gives the town the authority to have a sidewalk cleared if it's uh, habitually not cleared, um, but not necessarily by public work staff, uh, by outside contractor, and then somehow that those the costs are then leaned against the property. I don't know the exact uh, process, but I believe that's what the bylaw is. Okay, so there are, are there outside contractors that are currently employed we, to that, do that? That has, that has not been... Um, performed to my knowledge. Okay. Do you know if historically it's ever been done? I don't know. Mr. Okay. Chapdelaine has some further information on that. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. So I believe just bri uh, prior to my tenure as town manager when I was here as deputy, I know my predecessor, I, I believe it, it was proposed maybe three, four years ago, the change to that bylaw. It's sort of that clean and lean concept where come clean the sidewalk and then you're able to charge or lean the property. Uh, my recollection is that when we went out to um, solicit prices from contractors, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we weren't able to get uh, any sort of consistent interest to be able to effectuate it through contractors. And in the immediate aftermath of any kind of significant snow event, we don't have uh, the capacity with, with public works employees to be able to clear private sidewalks as we're still focused on usually town, mm -hmm. town owned property. So it, I, I would say it's absolutely something we're aware of. I know it's something me and Mr. Rademacher talked about throughout this winter and I, I think we need, we need to try to develop um, a better way to get those sidewalks cleaned. So I, I, don't, I don't have a final answer but I, I assure yeah. you it's on our radar I appreciate screen. that, thank you. Thank you, Sean Harrington. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Last year, we moved the recycling coordinator position from part-time to full-time uh, because they were going to increase recycling by targeting apartment buildings and other places that don't recycle consistently. Uh, consistently. Um, Mr. Moderator, what was the result um, cost savings through increased recycling in 2015, and what was the expected cost decrease due to recycling in 2016? You have the answer, Mr. Rademacher? No. <laughs> and these are the kind of questions you're supposed to ask in advance. Uh, Mike, oh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. I don't have those values exactly, um, but the reasons for increasing the time was not just for that purpose. There were other, um, other facets of that position that we were hoping to expand upon. We did do uh, quite a bit of uh, extra enforcement to um, encourage or to require folks to recycle in order to have their trash picked up. Um, we did target other apartment buildings. We did have increased enforcement, uh, but I don't have a uh, value as to what that but changed. So were there any planned savings, though, that you have or you know, any return that we've gotten so far from the position? That's a difficult, um, to some degree, to uh, answer. I mean, initially, when we went to the new contract, the uh, recycling or the new trash contract, where we did require recycling to have your trash picked up, uh, we went from, we saved about, um, it was 60 or some odd thousand dollars a year. Uh, this position essentially uh, manages that waste contract, uh, both answering calls from residents and also uh, coordinating work with the contractor. So not just the recycling part, but this mm -hmm. position coordinates that whole contract, which did save the town significant funds. Okay, thank you. More? Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. I move to terminate debate on the Public Works budget. Motion to terminate debate on the Public Works budget. It's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that is a two-third vote. Okay, the next budget that was held was facilities. Who wanted to talk about facilities? Mr. Harrington, not Mr. Harrington, Peter F Fiore. Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. This is beyond the scope because it's about public works. 
I'd like to get a round of applause for Public Works for the heroic effort just to keep the roads open this winter. That lady had her hand up next. Four rows back at the center. Passed. Now you, Sean. Uh, Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Um, due to finals, I kind of have some tough times getting through all the departments, trying to find this, uh, make sure I look at everything. You know, this is a new department. Can someone please explain a little bit what's going on here, you know, a little bit more detail on it? I, um, I understand it's new. I'm just some more detail on it. I just haven't had a chance to really get a chance to look at it. My apologies for not doing my town meeting homework before my college homework. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, so what you see here is uh, the first step in what will be a two-year process in the creation of a joint town school facilities department. Uh, currently, facilities is managed uh, in, a, in a primarily dispersed fashion with uh, multiple department heads having responsibility for their individual facilities. Uh, the majority of facility staff, uh, custodians and building maintenance staff being located in the school budget but still servicing town buildings. Uh, and no um, real coordinated uh, effort focused on facilities. Uh, the facility superintendent uh, is a division supervisor or a division head with, uh, currently contained under the jurisdiction of the Department of Public Works, but budgetarily contained within the school department. So I think that gives a little bit of a quick snippet of the, the disjointed nature of facilities. So starting two years ago, uh, uh, initiated by uh, a, a proposal or um, a suggestion by Barbara Thornton, a member of the Capital Planning Committee and town meeting member, to create a building maintenance committee, uh, was adopted by the Board of Selectmen, established this building maintenance committee. They met for the better part of the last two years, analyzing the town's uh, facilities and maintenance needs, uh, and coming up with a real robust set of recommendations that can be provided uh, to town meeting uh, uh, via email. I, I believe it's available on the town website. Um, and the recommendation ultimately had a number of steps that contained uh, collection of maintenance data, uh, better maintenance planning, both short, mid, and long-term going forward as uh, a nice accompaniment to the capital plan and investments that are made in town facilities. Uh, and then perhaps most importantly, uh, the creation of an actual standalone joint town school facilities department that would have a department head level uh, supervisory position. So what you see here um, <clears throat> is the 50% funding of a director of facilities with the remainder of that position uh, funded in the proposed school budget. And then you see two positions that are actually currently budgeted within the DPW budget on this current uh, fiscal year, fiscal 15, budgeted in uh, DPW, but here moved into facilities. Uh, next year, FY17, what we would plan to bring before you is one actual large consolidated town school facilities department uh, that would then move all of the currently school budgeted positions uh, and expense budgets under the uh, auspices of this one large facilities budget. Uh, if, if, that, if we're successful in, in this two-year plan, what would end up uh, being the result is what I think would be after the school department, police, fire, and DPW, the next largest department in town in terms of both personnel and budget, uh, and certainly also uh, in terms of complexity with the systems that need to be operated and maintained within our, <coughs> our various uh, town facilities. So uh, I, I hope that answers your question in regards to what we're trying to achieve. Tosti? I just wanted to add one, one thing is uh, we've done a tremendous amount of rebuilding in this town. Uh, we have rebuilt uh, almost all our elementary schools, our junior high, our middle school, our police station, our fire stations. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the answer, uh, the question that Barbara Thornton, had, well, are we going to maintain them? Well, th this whole plan was to put together the structure uh, to maintain those buildings so they can last as long as possible and we don't have to come back in 20 years and redo something because a building was not maintained. So I think this is a, a major step forward for the town and uh, I look forward to its uh, full implementation. Mr. Court. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. 
um, uh, to the town manager through the moderator, if I may. Um, would you say that um, because we have created this facilities department and we've looked hard at maintenance, that we will be able to stretch the life of the investments that we've made in new buildings and renovations? Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. That is absolutely one of the goals of the creation of this department. Okay. And would you say that you have, in the process of doing the planning exercise that you did for this, found efficiencies that will save you on the operating budget? So I would say that we uh, have some areas where we think we could find efficiencies, but there may be some areas where we find there might need to be a little bit of a beefing up of services. Okay. Uh, efficiencies certainly in the way we contract out to outside uh, maintenance vendors. Okay. Uh, th the way that's currently managed um, can certainly be improved, and I think we can find some financial efficiencies there. We, we do, I, I want to be very clear, uh, once this is up and running and there's a facilities director hired, uh, in terms of in-house uh, mm -hmm. building maintenance craftsmen, carpenters, plumbers, uh, I, I don't want to close out the possibility that after an analysis we realize that we need, mm -hmm. need more in-house staff. Okay, and would you say that, um, uh, that in terms of those areas where you may find that you have services, services you need to beef up, would you call that what you would call a targeted investment? and worth spending money on in order to preserve the buildings that we have invested so much of our capital money in? I th think that's fair to say. Okay, and would you call this making a plan? <laughs> <laughs> I, why did I have a feeling we were going somewhere? I, I, would, I, would, I would call it that, yes. You should have known. <laughs> Thank you. Stephen Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I rise to actually say that this is a great idea, that they're consolidating facilities. I think the town um, could do a great job with maintenance, or should do a better job with maintenance of what we you know, build. And um, this is exactly the type of thing that I was trying to get across earlier in this uh, budget discussion, that I think there's plenty of opportunities where they can consolidate and change around you know, what we've been doing. and um, you know with this facilities um, combination between many different departments, that's exactly what I'd like to see across the board. There's lots of opportunities to do improvements. So um, out of character, uh, I think it's a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mayor. Leslie Mayor, Precinct 21. I, I also think that um, combining the departments into a, a single facilities uh, department is a great idea. My question has to do with, um, I think this maintenance committee, his charge is looking at buildings. Who's looking at the external facilities and the assets that we have uh, for our outdoor facilities? Does this department also consider our parks, playgrounds, and other uh, external resources. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, that issue was discussed by the committee and is something that's being looked at as a future phase but isn't currently in an implementation uh, recommendation. So it's outside of the scope of what this committee is looking at, but it will be part of what we see a future committee or will the committee uh, I, see how things are going with this and then I'm concerned because I just heard that we lost half a parks person tonight that went over from a full-time uh, parks person into a full-time cemeteries person and so now we've we're down half a parks person and I'm hearing that this combined committee isn't taking into account the needs of our assets that we spend an awful lot of money uh, with capital improvements on, but have certainly a lot of needs when it comes to maintenance. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where it's gonna be addressed and how it's gonna be addressed. Well, I, I suppose I would say we'll, we'll have to determine if we want to uh, utilize the existing uh, facilities maintenance committee and, and recharge them with taking a look at this or perhaps reconstitute uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what we'd call it. We could come up with a, you know, exterior facilities, outdoor facilities, parks and playgrounds, whatever we'd want to call it. Okay. Um, but but I, th I think there is, there's absolutely a need for uh, 
a group of people to take a look at that and make some, make some recommendations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we do wanna make sure that the assets that we look at through the town also include our outdoor assets and that they're not forgotten. When we talk about facilities, it's not just buildings, it's the other places that we value in the town, which are assets, which are parks, playgrounds, playing fields, because um, a lot of our uh, citizens and uh, families, people of all ages, use those facilities and we need to continue to maintain them. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Barbara Thornton, Precinct 16. I just want to respond to the, the very good question that was just asked as the, uh, both as a citizen but also as the chairperson of the maintenance committee. When we started the maintenance committee, it was very much to consider all the assets, just as you suggested, and I think it is within the purview, uh, or has been within the purview of the maintenance committee to consider all of the assets. We have so many buildings, and the, the uh, rollout of a plan to initiate the maintenance uh, process was so huge that we decided to try and cut it uh, a little bit and phase it in, so there is a, as Annie LaCourt said, there is a long-term plan, uh, hypothetical, to think about uh, the fa the, all of the assets of the town, the, the physical assets, uh, but we left off also automobiles and, and, and moving equipment. We left off the fields, et cetera, just to be able to focus on the buildings so that the facilities director and the department could get their feet on the ground get it up and running, and then begin to expand it under the town manager's uh, agreement. Thank you. Okay. Mark McKay, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Budget 18 and all matters before it. A motion to terminate debate on budget 18 and all matters before. It's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a two thirds vote, and I so declare it. That closes 18, brings us on to the next budget that was held. Mr. Tosti. When you're looking at budget 19 here, uh, I sort of debated, we debated whether to put this in. I, I think, Mr. Moderator, if we can basically, for discussion and voting, uh, ignore A uh, and the total community safety and just go with B, police services, C, fire services, and uh, basically that's for public safety because all the others are being eliminated um, on it. So B and C would be the main th Oh, I see. Uh, so votes. the admin budgets are all old, so there's no use discussing those. Okay. Okay, now, who, wanted, who put a hold on public safety? Mr. Harrington and the other one. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. So um, one night, I'm looking at my um, cell phone and I'm trying to get a signal. And I notice that there's um, a network that says uh, APD underscore NWatch underscore node 096. Now, you know, I know the joke, FBI surveillance fan, to name your network that. But I went around town and I found other ones. And so my question, uh, Mr. Moderator, to the, um, the chief of police, I guess, or to you, through you, you can direct it to whoever you want, is, um, you know, we, we noticed there's about a million dollars for community safety, you know, um, million 52. I'd like to know whether any electronic gathering devices, such as automatic license plate readers, cell phone tower emulators, or any other electronic collection devices that is currently in use by the Arlington Police Department, and if so, or even if not, uh, what type of policies we have uh, to protect the privacy of residents? Chief? We 
Good evening, Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Uh, Mr. Stevens, there are no such devices, and we, we operate under a, uh, a very transparent law enforcement agency, and if, if there were any such devices, we would have had conversations with the Human Rights Commission uh, and others. Thank you. All right, I guess that answers the question. Thanks. Sean Harrington. Pass. Mr. Chappett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roland Chappett, Precinct 12. This may be a bit of a naive question, but there was an item on B12 under the fire services section. It's called uh, Fire Alarm System Maintenance. And it's been picked up this year because it came out of DPW previous years and it was reduced for the last couple of years by about $10,000 each year. I guess my question is, what is fire alarm system? What is that? I mean, nowadays we all have telephones and cell phones and so forth. So if we have a problem with the fire system, we just call the department. Where does this fit? Chief Jefferson? Uh, Robert Jefferson, fire chief. The fire alarm, whatever the, how, what did you call it? Fire alarm system maintenance. Fire alarm system maintenance. That, that's the old fire alarm system. It was re, used to always be carried in the public works budget. It's been reduced over the years. Yeah. It's the old pull blocks that are on the street that we removed. Yeah. But we still have um, radio boxes throughout the town. All town buildings, all schools, and private businesses are able to buy fire alarm radio boxes, which are much more efficient than the old uh, systems, and that's what that's for, to maintain that. It also maintains all the fire and police um, radio wires, which still run underground and overhead um, from the station in the center to the police station to the highland to the park circle, and all that has to be maintained for damages and repairs. So it's all maintained with radio frequencies? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Court. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. A couple of quick questions about the police budget. Um, so I wanted to ask the police chief whether he has been able to fund a couple of initiatives that were of concern to him when I was on the Board of Selectmen. But give us your questions, then I'll get them. The first question is about um, the ability to handle electronic crime, our ability to assist residents who may have experienced identity theft or other kinds of electronic fraud, um, and whether we are in a better position to do that now than we were a few years ago. Chief Ryan. Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Thank you, Ms. LaCourt. Uh, yes, uh, we have been able to do that through a number of regional partnerships mm -hmm. and training um, of our detectives uh, who have been trained up by the Attorney General's Office and the District Attorney's Office. Okay, thank you. Um, so, don't sit down. No, wait. You, you ask the questions and I say who gets to answer them. You're not yes, going to sit here and have a colleague <laughs> colloquy. All right. Um, so another initiative that you had hoped to work on, I know that we've established a resource officer at the high school and a diversion program, but you had talked at one point about the ability to also dedicate a resource officer to the junior high school. Have you been able to resource that position at all or even part-time? Yeah, we've not been able to do that, but we have been very successful at, at uh, working with both the high school principal and the middle school principal to carve up the time of the uh, school resource officer. and and um, it's, it's been effective. I, I think the superintendent would agree with that. Okay, would you describe yourself as content with this solution? I'm sorry? Would you describe yourself as content with this solution? Yes, I would. Okay, and then one final question about the police overtime budget. You've heard me ask this question before. How many hours of overtime on average are your officers working? Uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, 
See, that's the kind of question you're supposed to ask him in advance so he can give you a real answer. <laughs> I, I understand. In the past, he's been able to do it on the fly, so I apologize if you feel put on the spot. I just noticed that the budget is growing um, considerably, and I know that there's a question of at what point does it become inefficient to do overtime and more efficient to hire an employee versus the efficiency of overtime since we skipped the benefits. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think they're working a, a manageable amount of overtime and, and fatigue is not compromising their ability to perform their duties. And so when you do a cost benefit with a fully loaded police officer versus backfilling with overtime, I think um, that we are deploying our resources in a safe, uh, a safe and cost effective manner. Okay. Thank you. In the past, I've suggested to you that um, sending an officer to my house after 60 hours of overtime um, would not be the best idea because I would be worried about their level of fatigue. I can tell you for a fact that the officers who come to my house are fresh and ready to do their job. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Mr. Deist? John Deist? Mr. Deist? John Deist. John, did you have your hand up? Pass, okay. Mr. Smith? Scott Smith, Precinct 5, move the question on this budget. Second. Motion to terminate debate on public service budget. Um, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? In my opinion, it's a two-third vote. That closes budget 19. That brings us to um, inspection services. Who wanted to talk about inspections? Nobody. Okay. Education. Mr. Harrington. All right, wait a second. We've got to go a little slower here. Go ahead, Sean. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Originally, I was actually going to put up a, uh, try to amend the school budget, but instead I think I'll just try to talk this one through. Um, get my, where I keep my notes. Um, I, Clock. Thank you. Um, I saw at the school, uh, school committee meeting at special ed costs are not budgeted, uh, <clears throat> are not budgeted to go up 7% this year. It may not have gone up 7% on average the last five years. Is the town looking at whether this number is still the correct annual inflation number to budget for special ed? Should we decrease uh, this amount in the future? Basically, you have an, um, <clears throat> I know I asked a question, but a little bit of a reply to that. Um, we budgeted 7% for special ed, but there's only a 1.8% increase in their budget. The rest of that money went into the general ed budget. Basically, my question is, why is this okay? And why the money wasn't simply given back to the general fund rather than going into the general Mr. ed Mr. Tosti, and then Mr. Hainer on behalf of the school committee. The plan um, worked out with the long-term planning committee and the budget and revenue task force was to look at a 10-year average. And when you look at a 10-year average for uh, special ed, it is still approximately 7%. Uh, and every year, uh, we ask for the numbers and, uh, and see what the long-term uh, average is. And at this point, it's still 7%. Uh, the school system has done a very good job in bringing, uh, bringing down their out-of-district tuition by improving the quality of the, of the programs that are within the school. Uh, and that costs money. Uh, so that, uh, anyway, it's still within that 10-year average and uh, therefore still uh, recommended by the Finance Committee to be part of that. And now for the School Committee's opinion on that question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Haynes, School Committee. For some reason last year I didn't have to give my annual answer. I'll give it this year. No one can predict the expense for special education any given year. Some years, like in the, the past year, we've had a very light year on expenditures, but all it takes is one child needing very expensive services, which are mandated by the federal and state government, which is not within our control, that can blow a budget out. We've taken the fiscal responsibility to uh, develop a contingency fund, which a couple of years ago 
we had it, we were able to use it. We'll be able, and this is the important part. We cannot predict what is going to happen in the upcoming year. That's why it's necessary going along with what Mr. Uh, with the former speaker just said. Thank you. All right, I can understand that, but a six close to six hundred thousand dollars—is that really how much we're expecting a special ed student to cost? I mean, I guess I'm looking at this, and I'm wondering why not just give the money back to the general uh, the, uh, general fund, and then if you need it, ask for it. I mean, because other than that, it's just going dr directly to the general education fund. Why not? Why not just give it back to them if you need it? Ask for it. I mean, this was brought up during a FinCom meeting too. Uh, by one of the members who's not here tonight. I just, you know, because that's what the money was supposed to be for, and if you're not going to use it, why not just give it back, and then if you need it, ask for it. I think Mr. Um, Chapdelaine has a reason why he can't do that. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Just, just from a practical point of view, we would need to call another special town meeting to appropriate further funds. Uh, to the school department, so I think that would cause both an efficiency and practicality problem. All right, um, like I said, I'm not against the idea of having a little bit more than what you're, um, I mean, 1.8, I can imagine it being around like 2.8 or 3.8, but set, I mean, that's 6%, that's $600,000 I could be going to another department. I mean, I can understand putting 200,000 that, putting it to another, you know, keeping it there just in case you need it but the rest of that could go somewhere else. You know, you can't just have growth for the sake of growth, um, in a sense. Um, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. Um, sorry, but it's just the case. You have to address that, Mr. Tosti? Yeah, just one other element. Um, special education uh, is not an optional thing. In other words, if, uh, uh, if, if a child comes in and needs a certain degree of services, you can't argue in court that we don't have the money. So anytime special education uh, costs spike, like Mr. Hainer said, that money has, come back, has to come back out of general education. Um, so somehow they will have to find the money if all of a sudden that's, instead of going up 1%, it goes up 7 or 10%. Uh, they'll have to find the money. So uh, sometimes they try to put it back and balance it over, over a period of years. Mr. Watson? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Watson, Precinct 5. Um, just a, a question about management services. It seems like uh, since 2013 uh, that we have here in the budget, it's been pretty variable, and it's um, going up by 79% uh, projected for 2016. So uh, just a question of what is that, and uh, why is it so variable, and why is it going up so much for 2016? Dr. Bodie, can you answer that? Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent of Schools. Which page number are you referring to? Um, uh, this is uh, B13, Education yep. the, 21. This year, we have, uh, we have our contracts un not settled yet. And so what we have done is we have put in an amount of money that is in the admin budget. So I think what you're seeing is the effect of a contract year. Yes, it's put, it's, it's put, where we put that money that was set aside for collective bargaining is in the admin account. I see. And what, uh, can you talk a little bit more about why it seems to be very variable from year to year? Well, three year cycle. Do you want to speak to that, um, Diane? Ms. Johnson. Diane Johnson, uh, Chief Financial Officer for the School Department. Um, when we go into a negotiation cycle, we have to plan how much we're, we think we're going to spend through settlement, but we don't want to exactly show our hand by putting it out in excruciating detail. So we, we consolidate it under administration as a convenience of budgeting because the timing of the negotiation cycle and the timing of the budget doesn't line up as we would wish. In a perfect world, we'd settle the contracts and then do the budget. But since that's not possible, they run concurrently. We put the, we put the funds that we're planning, it may not be exact, 
that we're planning to use in settling our contracts into admin. And then there's two years where the contracts are settled. We know exactly how much we're spending for contracts. It's placed where the budgets, where the teachers are, where the other staff are. And then in the fourth year, we go back into a negotiation cycle, and the cycle repeats itself. Thank you for clarifying that. To Tully? Oh, Just answer. Um, one of the previous uh, speakers asked about the 1.8% increase. That is simply without any of our contracts settled. And again, it's to this point where we, we, we consolidate the money. So it is, it is not a 1.8% increase. Mr. Tully? Joe Telly, Precinct 14. I had the same question as the previous speaker, but um, I guess we got part of the answer. But my question would be, how much, how do we know what we are actually paying for management services? Mr. Schickman, can you answer on behalf of the committee? Uh, Paul Schickman, Chair of the School Committee. Uh, this uh, Finance Committee document is merely a down and dirty summary. You're voting the bottom line. If you would like more details, they are in the uh, budget book that we provided you from the school department. That would be this book. And if you want even more details for that, we've got line items galore on the, on the district website. So can you direct me to where, where in this book it is? Um, Ms. Jo uh, Ms. Johnson, can you direct Mr. Tully as to where in the book that line item is? So, Diane Johnson, CFO, School Department. There are a couple of different places where you can see this. The first is in this pie chart on page 32, where you can see admin services. And if you compare it to other years, you'll notice that the piece of the pie has gotten much larger this year. To look specifically, um, There are several departments, if you look on page 34, by the cost centers, there are several of the departments that are included in the um, central administration, and those would be school committee, superintendent, um, admin for curriculum and personnel, business office, payroll, um, elementary system-wide, and system-wide. So those are, the, those are the cost centers that are included in administration. Now okay. there, are, there are, those are the central administrative costs. There are also administrative costs in each of the school budgets. So for example, the high school, there'd be an administration line in there to represent the principal and the deans. But it's, I, I guess so, I would just make the observation that it's not apparent. I, I thank you for the explanation. It's not terribly transparent when I flip through this document, as lengthy as it is, to be able to determine that. Um, I would also, I guess also just by way of observation, if we're, if we're looking at the pie chart and we're gonna take school-based administration and there is a number in there, we simply have to subtract that from the other number that is in the Finance Committee report, the, the number that increased by 79% to get what the actual cost of the, the monies we're sort of trying to not tip our hand about. Is that fair? No, I, I'm sorry. Diane Johnson, CFO, School Department. Uh, that's not entirely clear. Um, one of the great confusions about the school budget relative to other town department budgets is that we do not receive 100% of our funding from the town appropriation. If you look at page 31, this pie chart, you'll see that there is a small but significant portion of funding that does not come from the town appropriation. And so the amount of money you see in the Finance Committee budget is only looking at the town appropriation portion. And the money you're seeing in the school budgets reflects not only the town appropriation, but funding we receive from grants, revolving, and other reimbursements. If you look at the funding summary page, which is page 30, that would be this page, you can see a breakout of how that works in terms of where the money is coming from. When you look at any of the expense breakdowns, either in this document or in our full budget on the website, you can see all of the things that we're planning to spend money on or in previous years have spent money on in a great deal of detail, but it doesn't parse it out amongst what is the town appropriation, what is grant, 
and what is revolving. It's all together because we consider it holistically as we, as we do our best for our students. And so it does create confusion between the FinCom budget and the school department budget. Would it be fair to say that if someone had the wherewithal to understand all of this, they would be able to divine the amount we're so-called not tipping our hand about? They would see an amount that we're guesstimating would be a fair settlement, okay. but probably will not be our final settlement number. All right. I, uh, this, just, the point simply being, it's the first I've ever heard about sort of trying to hide money in this fashion. And it may be customary. It may be that we've done it in past years. I guess looking at the, the numbers going back a couple fiscal years, it looks like the, it fluctuates up, fluctuates down. So we, we apparently have done it in the past. But um, it, it's new to me. It seems... Uh, uh, it seems somewhat um, sort of not in the interest of fair play, but I understand we all have our jobs we have to do, so I will leave it at that. Um, with my remaining minute and 39 seconds, is it uh, permissible to make a motion to adjourn, Mr. Moderator? It is. Yep. You can make a motion. Anyone can make a motion to adjourn at any time. It's an interruptible motion. I, I so a motion move. to adjourn. It's been seconded. I, is, um, Five more budgets that are on hold, so I don't think we're going to finish it tonight. All in favor of adjourning, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? We'll see you Monday. Um, Any other notices of reconsideration?